This is a revision film for one of your set works. It's 8% of your exam, so you need to know it in quite a lot of detail. I've included some musical examples and I'm going to attach some questions as well for you to go through afterwards. OK, so your set work is Eine Kleine Nacht Music by Mozart. It's only movement three. It was written in 1787 and the title translates as a little serenade. Now a serenade is a piece of music that is sung or played in the evening to someone we love as you can see in the picture. The piece has four movements. A movement is a short piece in itself. So the four movements that you'd find in Ina Klein and that music are a leg row, so a fast section, followed by a romance, which is quite a slow section. Then we get the minuet and trio, which is what we need to know for our exam. And then finally, a fast rondo section. So, what instruments was the piece written for? Well, the piece was written for the following instruments. It had four parts. Violin one part, a violin two part, a viola, which remember is deeper, a lower sound than the violins and slightly longer, and a cello. Now, sometimes in the music, a double bass will perform the cello part, but it'll sound an octave lower, so eight notes lower than the part is written. Although the piece is written for a single instrument, a string quartet, because there's four instruments in it, is often performed as a string orchestra. This means that each part would have a small number of players. So, for example, six violin ones, six violin twos, two violas, two cellos and a double bass. So what is minuet and trio form? Minuet and trio is also known as ternary form because it has an A section, which in this case is a minuet, followed by a B section, which is the trio. And then we hear the minuet repeated at the end, which is our final A section. Each of the sections is broken down into smaller sections like a little binary form piece, so a piece with two contrasting sections. Section A for the minuet is eight bars long and is repeated, and it moves on to section B, which is also eight bars long, and then it's repeated, and that makes up the minuet or our A section. We move on to the trio, which is also like a little binary piece in itself. We hear section A, which is repeated, and then section B, a contrasting section, which is also then repeated. Finally, we hear the minuet that we heard at the beginning of the piece um, to finish the piece off. Just reminding you that repeat marks, what they look like, it's at the bottom of the screen, and it means that you repeat the music that is in between these symbols. So let's have a little listen to the piece together, and I'll point out where the sections are. So, this is the minuet, section A. And it repeats. Section B of the minuet. Repeated. Now the trio. This is section A of the trio. Section A repeated. Moving to section B of the trio. Section B repeated. Thank you. 
No, listen to the minuet and see if you can see where the section A and B are. So let's start off looking at the features of a minuet. A minuet has a 3-4 time signature. It originated in France in the form of a dance for two people in triple time. The piece starts off with a musical feature called an anacrusis, which is like an upbeat. If you have a look where the blue arrow is pointing at the beginning of the music, we see a one-beat note or crotchet before the start of the first full three-beat bar. It is used when the composer wants a note before the first strong beat of the bar. If we have a look, both the first and second violins at the start have an anacrusis. Have a look at the end of the piece. We notice at the end of the piece that there is only two beats in the bar. This accounts for the anacrusis at the start. Here is what the anacrusis sounds like. Notice that there are only the violin 1 and violin 2 playing at the start before the viola and the violin cello start. We're going to have a look now at the musical elements that Mozart has used to create the minuet. This is really important for your exam because you may be asked to describe or comment on two or three of these features, especially in the long question. Let's start having a look at the structure or the form of the piece. As you can see on the music to the left, I've labelled the A and B section because the minuet is in binary form, which has two contrasting sections. Both of the sections are eight bars in length. This is a feature of the classical period and each section is repeated as indicated by the marks at the end of each section. Let's have a listen to the first section. A. OK, let's have a listen now to the contrasting B section. As we can see, the second section, B, finishes with the same material that section A ends with. So the last four bars of A and the last four bars of B use the same material. Dynamics. The minuet starts forte, or F, which means loud. The second half of the minuet, in contrast, is P, which is short for piano, or quiet. This is only for three bars, then we get a crescendo, which means to get louder, and the piece ends F or loud as it starts. Let's listen to the whole of the minuet together and see if you can hear the changes in dynamics. <laughs> means the different layers of the music and how they are arranged in the piece. The minuet has a homophonic texture, which means it's made up of a melody and accompaniment parts. This is a typical feature of the classical period. As we can see in the music, 
violin one and violin two have the main melody. The second violin doubles, which means plays exactly the same thing as the first violins. The first violin plays an octave higher, which means eight notes higher than the second violin. We can see the texture gets more complicated towards the end of the first phrase, as the viola has a double stopping in bars seven and eight. This is when two strings are played at the same time to produce a chord. We can see this in the green box. Finally, for texture, we can see something called contrary motion at the start of the minuet. This is where the violins are going in an ascending or upwards direction and the viola and cello are going in a descending or downwards direction. With the instruments going in different directions in pitch, we have contrary motion. The tempo. The tempo is the speed of the music and we can see at the start of the piece it is written allegretto. This means moderately fast, a speed which is a little bit slower than allegro, which we know to mean fast. The melody. The melody in the minuet is mainly conjunct. This means it moves by step. The violin parts, as we can see, are ornamented. This is a feature of classical music. The melody is decorated with the use of trills, as we can see in the red box, and an appoggiatura, which we can see in the green box. An appoggiatura takes up half of the note that comes after it. So you play a half note G and a half note F. Let's have a listen to the first eight bars of the minuet. Listen out for the appoggiatura and the trills. Here comes the appoggiatura now. Trills. Now have a listen on your own and see if you can point them out. We're going to listen to the melody again. Notice on the music that there are little dots over the notes. This is called staccato and this means we play the notes short and spiky. See if you can notice this. Have a listen. <laughs> The violin one and violin two part are playing the same things in octaves or eight notes apart. This is known as doubling. The violin one and two have the main melody throughout the minuet. Let's have a look at the second eight bars of the minuet. In the second eight bars, the melody is constructed using a sequence. The orange box shows an idea which is repeated a note lower in the purple box. We call this a descending sequence. Have a listen. The melody in the second eight bars is also more chromatic in movement. This means it moves by a semitone. An example of this can be seen in the blue box where we go from the note G to G sharp in the violin parts. This is a semitone. Have a listen. look at the tonality or the key of the piece. The piece starts in the key of G major 
This has one sharp in the key signature, as we can see in the green box at the start of the piece. The piece then, briefly, goes to D major. We know this because we can see the introduction of a C sharp, highlighted in the red box. The first eight bars ends in G. The second set of eight bars starts in G, but this time modulates or changes key to E minor, which is the relative minor to G major. Then we move to D major, which is the dominant of G major, before we finally end up back in the tonic key of G major. Let's have a listen to the minuet together and I will point out the keys. G major. Moving to D major. And back to G major. To D. And back to G major. Moving through E minor. D major. And back. Minor, D major, moving back to G. The rhythm. The bass line played by the cello, and as we know sometimes the double bass, is a mainly crotchet or one beat movement which drives the piece forward. Have a listen again to the minuet and focus on the cello in the bass part. There is one note on each beat and it is played staccato. This is driving the music forwards. It is made up of mainly quavers. Quaver runs. Then we have some crotchets. And some quavers. The harmony of the minuet. This refers to the chords and the cadences that make up the minuet. The harmony is described as diatonic. This is a feature of the classical period. Diatonic means the notes in the piece relate to the key. The piece is kept interesting by chords changing almost every beat. Most of the chords are in their root positions or first inversions in the minuet. A chord in its root position for example, chord G, which is made up of the notes G, B, D, will have a G note in the bass part, the tonic note. A first inversion chord will mean that the middle note of the chord is in the bass. For example, as we can see in the yellow box, the F chord, which is made up of F, A and C, has an A in the bass, which is the second note of the chord. This makes it a first inversion. Have a look at the yellow box. From bar 13, the harmony from bar 5 to 8 is repeated. This is at the end of the 8 bar sequence. The 8 bar sequence ends with a perfect cadence in G major. Remember, a perfect cadence is like a musical full stop. It uses chord 5, which in G major will be chord D, going to chord 1 in G major, which is G, B and D. 
In the minuet, there are examples of seventh chords. We can have a look in the purple box, which shows a D7 chord, which has a D, an F sharp and an A, and then the C, which is the seventh note. There are also examples of diminished chords, diminished seventh chords. In the green box, we have A diminished seventh, and in the red box, we have G diminished seventh. These two chords are really important things to remember if you want to access the higher levels. Make sure you know the notes that make up both of these chords. We are now going to have a look at some features of the trio. Like the minuet, the trio, which follows it without a gap, has a time signature of three beats in a bar. Like the minuet, it also starts with an anacrusis, the musical upbeat. But this time, it is heard just in the violin one part and is made up of two half beat or quaver notes. The trio is labelled sotto voce. This term means in a quiet or hushed voice. At the end, the words minuet or de capo mean go back to the start and move different This gives the piece its ternary form. We have the minuet, the trio, and then the minuet at the end. Let's have a listen to the trio in its entirety. Now we're going to have a look at the musical elements that make up the trio. Let's start with the structure or form of the piece. The trio is in binary form. Again, this means it has an A and a contrasting B section. I have marked these on the score to the left. Unlike the minuet, the sections are different lengths. The A section is 8 bars in length but the B section is 12 bars long. Like the minuet though, both sections of the trio are repeated. The dynamics. This is the volume of the trio. In contrast to the minuet, the trio starts quiet or P. The second half of the trio starts loud or F, but this only lasts for three bars. Then we see a symbol, which means diminuendo, or getting quieter, which leads to the last eight bars of the piece being quiet. We're going to have a listen to the trio, picking up on the repeat of section A, and I will describe to you the dynamics. So on the repeat, we're starting off quiet. Now the B section starts loud, then we've gone back quiet again. And we remain quiet till the end of the 12 bar phrase. Then we go loud again as we repeat B and then the diminuendo to quiet again. of the trio, keeping in with the classical style of the piece, is also homophonic like the minuet. This means it has a melody and an accompaniment part. 
The violin has the tune in the first eight bars, but then it is joined and doubled by violin two for the first four bars at the start of B, which is highlighted in the green box. Again, they are playing in octaves or eight notes apart. The viola part also joins in with the melody at this point in the piece, but it is in thirds, which means it is playing three notes lower than the violin two part. For most of the trio, the violin two and viola play quaver harmony patterns. The bass line, as we can see, plays octave leaps for most of the trio. That means going from one note up to the same note, eight notes higher. The tempo of the piece, or the speed, doesn't change in the trio, so it remains constant throughout the whole of the piece. Remember, this is allegretto, which means moderately fast. The melody of the trio. The melody, like the minuet, begins with an anacrusis or upbeat. Violin 1 has the main melody throughout. At the start of section B, violin 1 is joined by violin 2 and the viola for four bars. The melody, like the minuet, is mainly conjunct, which means it moves by step. Let's have a listen to the trio. See if you can hear the violin one part playing the tune and then it being joined by violin two and the viola at the start of section B. So violin one playing the tune. Violin two and viola are playing quaver harmony parts. And on the repeat, and we can hear the cellos playing octave loops. Right, here comes section B. Where violin 1, violin 2 and the viola all have the tune for four bars. Before now, we've gone back to just violin 1 having the main melody. So violin 1, violin 2 and viola together. And just the violin again. Okay, so I'm going to play it again now and I want you to see if you can hear those changes. Okay, so there are some chromatic movement parts in the violin one part. This is different than how the melody was constructed in the minuet. The piece is not modulating, which means changing key. The chromatic notes are just there for decoration to the music. You can see examples of these have been highlighted in the green boxes in section A. Let's just have a listen, listen together to the little chromatic parts. Have another listen. Remember, chromatic steps mean moving a semitone at a time. So in the first green box, we have G, G sharp and A, and then E, E sharp, and then F sharp. 
The melody is also made up of a sequence, which we can see in the orange box. This idea in the orange box is repeated a third or two notes lower in the purple box. This is the same for bar six of section A. Let's have a listen to the orange and purple boxes in context. I will play you B. Have a listen for the sequence. Here comes the sequence now. Now. Have a listen and see if you can recognise that sequence by yourself. Let's have a look at the tonality or the key of the trio. The trio starts in the key of D major. I've highlighted in the green box that it has two sharps in the key signature, F sharp and C sharp. D major is the dominant key of G major, which was the key of the minuet. So they are both related to each other. The piece in the trio then modulates to the key of A major in section B. A major is the dominant major of D major, or the dominant dominant of G major, which is the minuet. We can see that it's moved to A major because there is now the G sharp in the melody parts. I've highlighted this in the red box. The trio, while starting in D major, also ends in D major, which is ready then for the minuet to come back in G major. The rhythm of the trio is mainly made up of quavers in the melody part and occasionally a dotted crotchet, which is the equivalent to three half notes. The harmony lines are mainly quavers and the bass part is again made up of mainly crotchet or one beat octave leaps. The first two beats of each bar are to be played staccato in the bass part. Remember this term, it means short and spiky, as they have a dot underneath. We can see an example of this in the purple box. Finally, let's talk about the harmony parts. Can you remember what this means? Yes, we're talking about the chords and the cadences. The harmony is described again as diatonic, a key feature in classical music. Although in this instance, it's mainly diatonic because there's chromatic passages in the melody part. The chords change at a much slower rate than in the minuet. In the minuet, the chords change practically every beat. But here in the trio, as we can see in purple, the chords change nearly every two bars. Section A of the trio ends in a perfect cadence in D major. The speed of the chord changes quicker towards the perfect cadence in D major. Can you remember what two chords make up a D major perfect cadence? That's right, chord 5, which is an A major chord, A, C sharp and E, going to chord 1, which is a D chord, D, F sharp and A. The last eight bars of B go back to the slow rate of change we saw at the start of the trio. The trio finishes with a perfect cadence in D major, setting the piece up for the return of the minuet in G major. Have a look at the perfect cadence in the green box. Chord five to chord one. Let's have a listen to the trio and listen out for the chord changes slow at the start of the trio and listen for the perfect cadences at the end of section A and the end of section B. D 
card, D card, A card, A card, D card, B minor, then we've got perfect cadence in D. Then we go back to slow chord changes. And remember, listen for the perfect cadence at the end. It sounds like a musical full stop. You now have all the information you need for your set work on the Minuet and Trio by Mozart. Can you remember what date it's written in? 1787. That's a really important date you need to remember because it could be a question on your exam. Now I'm going to play the Minuet and Trio and talk you through the key points that you need to remember. The melody in the minuet starts conjunct. It's played by violin one and two and it has some trills to decorate. The dynamics are F and the key is G major. The second part of the minuet starts quiet but then we have a crescendo which takes us back to an F dynamic or low. The texture is homophonic and can you remember what doubling means? Where the violin 1 and 2 play the same thing in octaves. Now we've moved on to the trio which in contrast starts quiet. Only the first violin has the melody now. The key is modulated to D major. The texture is still homophonic, but we mainly have quaver rhythms now. The second section of the trio starts loud because the violin 1, 2 and 3 have the melody for the first four bars. As you can hear now, it moves back to just violin 1 having the melody. of chord change in the trio than in the minuet, with the chords only changing every two bars. In the minuet, remember, it changes on every single beat. Then, after the trio, we go back again to the beginning to the minuet. Remember, the minuet starts in G major, but modulates to E minor and D major in the middle. 